Hi, thank you um, uh, for the opportunity to tell you a little about what, what I do. I just want to preface my talk by saying that um, I don't do cold atoms. Um, and so some of the, the terminology and some of the, the things that I'm talking about, the context might be a little weird given you know, some of the, the, uh, the talks we've heard earlier. Um, I do work on optical pumping in alkaline metal and noble gas systems. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what we do and some of the capabilities. And I'll just throw out something maybe at the end um, that suggests a role that, that, uh, that, that I and, and perhaps my group could play uh, in this. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, alkaline metal atoms. And I think probably most of you are familiar with, uh, with a diagram, an energy diagram that looks like this. And we deal a lot with rubidium we're going to deal in vapor cells kind of at room temperature and above. And, you know, this is the D1 transition that we deal with a lot, 795 nanometers. If I apply a small magnetic field, then I can Zeeman split both of these uh, levels. And the only reason, this is, a, this is a, a false picture, by the way, in case you haven't already figured out, there is no alkaline metal that doesn't have nuclear spin. And so these are kind of this is a fake alkaline metal that for the moment doesn't have nuclear spin. I'll get back to that. But I just want to remind you, of course, that the transition, this D1 transition is big. It's a volt and a half compared to KT, whereas even in a large laboratory magnetic field, the Zeeman splittings in these levels are small. And so you expect the atoms to live in the ground state, which they do, um, even though I'm going to use the excited state to optically pump and polarize the ground state. And what I normally would expect in these Zeeman states is that the spins are, spin populations are split 50-50, and that's why, I need, uh, that's why I need my light. So to explain the basic physics, again, for the zero nuclear spin atom, um, this is what my next slide is going to look like. And I'm just going to take the, uh, the, the, these two states and these two states and put them on top of each other, suppress the very small Zeeman splitting, and show you these two states where, again, now in the ground state I have spins uh, equally distributed in either uh, state. You know the selection rules. This is a nice, big, fat E1 transition with a big oscillator strength. And uh, the usual selection rules apply. But if I use circuitly polarized light, I pick up a, a, an additional selection rule. So if I use, for example, sigma plus light, I can only drive transitions from this uh, ground state to this uh, excited state with the M sub J equal plus a half. Turns out these things actually collisionally mix. It doesn't really matter. They can fall back to either state. And when they do, uh, they fall back with, turns out, because of the collisional mixing, equal probability. Otherwise, it would be klebsch gordon coefficients and things that I don't need to get into. But the point is, if I'm continually driving this transition, I'm continually depopulating this state. And um, these atoms. Uh, violate the selection rule for, 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 for this light. So I'm only driving these transitions. And so there would have to be, because I'm using light in the opposite direction, there'd have to be a state, a sublevel here that I could pump into, and that doesn't exist. So the atoms get stuck here, and I have an ensemble of polarized electrons or polarized alkali metal atoms. One of the things we like to do in our lab a lot is put noble gases, our favorite noble gases, or spin one half, two of which are, are stable, helium-3 and xenon-129. Uh, right now, our group's focused a lot on doing xenon-129, but you can get these sort of spin exchange collisions. That's, that's my one um, animation. That's, I, you know, my students do much better animations than me, but that's the one I can do. Um, so the angular momentum that started in the light, you know, it, it, in the collision with the rubidium gets exchanged with the nuclear, the nuclear spin of the xenon. It's kind of interesting, right, because that electron can overlap the nucleus during a collision, much the same way as, as uh, you all know about uh, sort of intraatomic uh, hyperfine splitting in alkali metals and hydrogen, the 21 centimeter line and all that. It's the same thing. It happens during a collision. And it's pretty remarkable if you plot, uh, theoretically, the, the wave function uh, as a function of interatomic distance. So here's for xenon. This is the locations of the rubidium and the xenon nucleus. And this is the rubidium valence electron wave function. And you can see at four angstroms away, it's just as big on the xenon nucleus as it is on its own nucleus. And that's what drives uh, fast spin exchange. Well, what we would call fast. By atomic physics standards, all of these processes are pretty slow. Xenon is typically seconds to minutes. 
Helium actually takes hours. So I have to rely on an environment for my helium atoms that doesn't relax the helium on the time scale of hours. So I spend a lot of time worrying about surface interactions with the glass cells in which I generate these populations. Um, this is kind of a crude schematic of what this might look like. I'll just point out, so we've got a laser collimating uh, quarter wave plate that converts linearly polarized to circularly polarized light and then some kind of, of glass cell inside an oven. Modest 30 Gauss magnetic fields do this. We heat the cell up to some reasonable temperature to get a decent vapor pressure of the alkali metal. Once, once polarized, I can cool the cell down. The alkali metal plates to the sidewalls of the cell and the angular momentum can't come out the way it got in. So now I have this kind of polarized nuclear magnet. Um, I just want to point out quickly that the applications that I'll tell you about briefly in many ways were driven by the development of these diode lasers. So when I was starting in graduate school and working on some of this stuff, we had roomfuls of argon ion lasers and titanium sapphire lasers pulling, you know, 50 kilowatts out of the wall and costing $200,000 and on a good day you got like a watt, okay? <laughs> so these things are like this big right? They're 70% efficient converting, you know, light from the, the, the power out of the wall. Now, they're not spectroscopically all that great, but who cares? To me, I call them photon fire hoses as opposed to, you know, no self-respecting spectroscopist would refer to this as a laser, but we, we only care about having the photons, and that, that, that's what works for us, and so it's a light-limited process is my final message, and if you got a lot of light, I can give you a lot of polarized gas. So here's some of what this looks like. Sometimes we make cells like this that have valves on them. So gas goes in, I polarize it, gas comes out. For instance, if I want you to breathe it so I can take a picture of your lungs, more on that in a minute. Um, sometimes we do, like for xenon, it's fast enough that we can do this kind of polarized xenon on tap where there's a laser going down into a long cell and a flow of gas coming up through this magnetic field and I kind of polarize it on the fly and then I cryogenically separate it and the polarization survives the phase transition using liquid nitrogen or something like that. And then I can thaw it out later and use it for experiments. So this is what it might look like. It charges like a capacitor, not terribly surprising. The fundamental differential equation is exactly the same. It's based on the spin exchange rate divided by the spin exchange rate divided by, or plus whatever auto relaxation rate is there for the noble gas. And then there's this kind of charging exponential. So this is what we see. See, this particular transient has a characteristic time of minutes, okay? Now, uh, you can then sort of uh, measure how long your magnet's gonna stay around, how long the spins are gonna stay polarized. And for helium-3, because it just doesn't interact with much, and you don't have electrons, you can get these very long relaxation times. So you can see this one, the, the relaxation, longitudinal relaxation time of the spins is measured at 60 hours. My colleagues at NIST see hundreds of hours. And all I want to point out, since my, one, at least one of my graduate students is in the crowd, is that I do allow my students to go to bed at night, okay? And I do allow them to sleep. And they can, uh, uh, you know, acquire the points during the day, okay? Uh, here's some more tools. This is what my lab here looks like. And I'll just point out, um, this is what a cell looks like. You know, we make our own. We have a, a gas handling system. Uh, the glass blower makes manifolds for us. My students learn how to blow glass. They learn how to seal cells off, how to distill alkali metal into the cells, and uh, how to run uh, this thing. And um, uh, that's something that not very many groups do anymore. There was a, a lot of cell making uh, dating back to the 50s and the 60s when people were doing all sorts of things with, uh, with alkali metals and optical pumping. But... Uh, uh, we're one of the few groups that still makes these vapor cells, and uh, I actually make vapor cells for a lot of groups that are interested in, in doing similar work. So here are some of the applications. Um, so my colleague at Wisconsin uh, has developed, this is a, a NMR gyroscope. This actually flies in defense satellites. It's got like a little light source inside and polarized xenon, that's, and the xenon is set processing in a small magnetic field. And of course, that precession frequency can read out as the rotational acceleration of, of the device. And so you've got this really tiny little device that serves as a, as a gyro. 
Again, these processing noble gas spins don't interact, interact very much. If you get a nice uniform field for them, they're a great clock. And it turns out heavy noble gases are great platforms for looking for physics beyond the standard model. For instance, you know, permanent electric dipole moments, that's an ongoing, um, that's an ongoing exploration in our field. Uh, porous materials characterization, I do NMR on some things. Xenon has a great chemical shift range. If it sticks to things, I can tell you a lot of times what it's sticking to just based on the chemical shift of its resonance frequency. And there's been a lot of work characterizing sort of high surface to volume materials uh, using that. Biosensors, that's mostly the province of Alex Pines and, and uh, various people down at Berkeley that have functionalized xenon, attached it to, to, to things in a cage and make it light up when, when some targeting moiety is bound to a, 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 particular, uh, a particular target. And then the one that I'm probably closest to is this uh, lung imaging, which I've been involved with now for some 20 years. It's still kind of looking for its killer app, but um, I'm collaborating now with a group in North Carolina that's developing polarized xenon for use in medical imaging. We're kind of the physics side. It's one of these goalie grants with, uh, with the NSF, and we're on the physics side, and they're developing the techniques for doing the imaging. Um, Let's see. So I just want to come back a little bit and talk about one more thing that, that we're, we're interested in doing now that maybe is a little closer to, to, to things that have been discussed here. Um, of course, the real rubidium ground state, as many people have, have talked about in previous talks, is actually a hyperfine split ground state. That's the real ground state where there's a strong coupling between the electron spin and the nuclear spin. And if you apply the same magnetic field, so the physics we're really talking about is are these manifolds of, of magnetic uh, hyperfine states. Um, for the example here is given for rubidium-87, where the Zeeman splitting, in, uh, you get an increased Zeeman splitting with, with uh, increasing applied magnetic field. Um, we operate, so here's the bright Rabi spectrum here, and, and others have talked about uh, this, this limit in very low magnetic field where the Zeeman coupling is very weak compared to the hyperfine splitting, you have one resonance line. And in contrast to what many have talked about, transitions between these two manifolds or between manifolds here and, and hyperfine manifolds in the excited state, I'm talking about the magnetic transitions between neighboring states within the F equals two manifold or the F equals one. Turns out we're always interested in F equals two because we do optical pumping and we always end up pushing the atoms into either uh, maximum angular momentum states, m sub f equals plus two, or m sub f equals minus two. We also, but we do operate in the regime where we see and can measure the quadratic Zeeman splitting. So the gyromagnetic ratio would be this for all the lines at very low magnetic field, just the electron gyromagnetic ratio with a two i plus one, where i is the nuclear spin and the denominator. Um, but we operate in this place where there's the quadratic splitting, and we can actually see that. So here's a spectrum of optically pumped rubidium showing you these hyperfine resonance lines. And the notation here is just, uh, is just F, and then the, the number that's in between the two M sub F values in the transition. So if it's three to two, I write down five halves. If it's two to one, I write down three halves, that kind of thing. Okay, so I can get this spectrum. And this is an optically detected spectrum, and that's pretty cool. So we do Faraday rotation, uh, optical detection, electron paramagnetic resonance. And I won't say too much about this, except that it involves this probe beam. We're looking at Faraday rotation, and, uh, and when the individual hyperfine states are excited, we detect a change in the modulation of the Faraday rotation uh, going through the, the uh, transverse through the cell. And what we can do, uh, is we can use these lines as magnetometers. And so we can generate a locked oscillator that follows the changes in the local magnetic field. And why do I care? Well, when I'm monitoring this population of nuclear spins, they generate a magnetic field. And so I can actually use the alkaline metal atoms to monitor that magnetic field, and then also say something about the physics of the polarization and relaxation processes. And in fact, that's kind of what we do. We use the rubidium atom as an embedded magnetometer. It's very sensitive to the local magnetic field. And we can monitor the shift of this EPR resonance line with our locked oscillator and thereby monitor the local magnetic field that's sensed by 
the uh, alkaline metal atoms. So um, it turns out that, that in order to do this, we need to calibrate the frequency shift that we see. And uh, that always looks like, the, those shifts always look like some kind of magnetic moment interacting with some kind of magnetic field. In the EPR sense, it's always the moment of the rubidium atom and the field that's generated by the polarization of the noble gas. Here's polarization of xenon, the density of xenon. And so it works, uh, except that we have to calibrate it with this uh, little enhancement factor, which compares the, the field that's generated by the xenon uh, uh, compared to a continuous magnetized medium. It's much bigger than you think it would be because the field actually results from the hyperfine interaction. So there's a quantum mechanical overlap. There's an enhancement to the field that's sensed by the rubidium magnetometer. And um, so we can calibrate that shift and we can measure, we can do polarimetry on our noble gases by measuring these frequency shifts, okay? So this is work measuring these calibration constants is work we did uh, a few years ago. More recently, we've actually started doing polarimetry on the nuclear spins with optically detected rubidium EPR. And so this is a monitored uh, frequency, uh, a precession frequency of the alkali metal and EPR frequency uh, relative to, you can see it's relative to about 18.2 megahertz, and our fluctuations get down to maybe 20 or 30 hertz out of that, so we're pretty good. Certainly good enough to see the shifts that are generated by destroying the polarized ensemble of helium-3. So this cell happens to have both helium-3 and xenon-129 in it, and so we first destroy the helium-3, then we destroy the xenon. The xenon has a very fast recovery rate, which we can also monitor using the same technique. And that's really the end of my talk, uh, except to say that I, I just, you know, found this and threw it up there. A lot of the same techniques, you know, sort of optical, optical detection and spin manipulation and optical pumping that I've been using for a long time to explore these, these alkaline metal noble gas systems are applicable to NV centers. I haven't gotten really involved yet in NV centers. Peter and I have talked about it various times and thought, you know, well, wouldn't it be cool? But... I think it's something that, you know, as, as we kind of get excited about what we're doing here, it's something that I would really be interested in considering. So that's why I put it up there. This is my group. And I just want to point out, great undergraduates here at WSU. Uh, just had two of them graduate. One is at Rochester Institute of Technology. The other is started in, in astronomy, actually, at Cornell. And uh, acknowledged some funding. As I said, I have a uh, uh, one of these, I can't remember what the acronym is, but it's LI is liaison with industry. And that's the company that we collaborate with in North Carolina that's developing, um, that's developing uh, lung imaging with polarized xenon. And so thanks so much for your attention. I'm going to apologize in advance. I have a meeting to go to at two o'clock and involves the provost and my dean. So I really have to be there. Um, I'll take a few questions if, if we have time, but if we don't, that's all right. Thanks. In the back. Oh, thank you for your talk. So my question is, why is your isotope of choice rubidium-87 rather than rubidium-85? And is there any, I know, influence of rubidium-85 in your vapor sale? Really, I mean, I can do frequency sweeps, or I can see both, both sets of spectra if I want to. 85, 87 are completely optical constants. In fact, I could throw other alkaline metals into my cell and pump them too, because the cross sections are exchanged in the alkaline metals that are being put on the cell. But really, everybody's old. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I was just curious about some of the practicalities of the lung imaging. What, uh, what fraction of, uh, of the polar gas is mixed with the oxygen needed for the... <laughs> and oh, then, all of it. And yeah. then, and then what, um, how long does it take to acquire a single lung image? Can you do dynamics? I, I don't know. You actually can, and I wish I, I, wish I had. I, I have some film loops that would be taking too long to bring up. But 
but people are interested in this. Yeah, and it's actually, that's the thing, lung function is the thing you care about, and lung function of the lung is new gas. And so there are people studying this idea that you can look at gas in real time to treat the lungs. The problem is just what we said at the beginning, which is that you have interaction with oxygen that relaxes the gas. Now, that by itself isn't a bad thing, necessarily, because you can image very quickly. So you can acquire images in you know, milliseconds, okay? Or tens of milliseconds, depending upon pixel size and you know, how, how much resolution you want. The problem is that if you interpret your images as density weighted, means spins are here, spins are not here, then it's confounded by the relaxation. So as the relaxation happens, and if it's differential throughout the lungs, then you run into a picture where you're not sure whether the signal you see is due to lots of helium that's relaxed or very little helium that's fully compressed. And since the lung has different parts where, and especially in lung disease, one of the, the manifestations of it can be, you know, good exchange here, not so good exchange here. So it turns out that one of the contrast mechanisms is really useful here for fusion. So because that doesn't depend on spin density, you can tell something about how the mean square displacement of the atoms over a certain period of time tells you, for instance, something about how emphysema progresses. Because emphysema is a disease where the alveolar walls are destroyed, and you go from tiny restricted spaces to the, the larger. Anything else really quick? Yeah. OK, thanks, Brian. Thanks so much. I'm sorry I have to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next, Martin's going to tell us a little bit about one of the implementations of a, of a device application for spin orbit coupling. All right, thank you. Um, so yesterday, Young Chen talked a lot about spintronic devices and materials research and how it's really important for developing quantum technologies moving forward. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you about an implementation of an atomtronic device, which has uh, introduced a new type of potential spintronic device. Okay, so current spin switching devices deal with either magnetic field manipulation or electric field manipulation. So in the case of magnetic, magnetic field manipulation, uh, you have things like spin transfer torque devices or STT. Um, this magnetic field manipulation requires a lot of switching power. And so in more recent years, there's been a lot of movement towards electric field manipulation. And so this has led to different types of materials like the ones listed here. Oh, I have a, a laser pointer, the ones listed here. It will not advance my slides, no. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to tell you about a non-magnetic, so an electric field manipulation, spin switch device that only works in one direction. Okay, so in a way you can think of it kind of like a spin diode. So the way that we do this is we implement spin orbit coupling in our system. So Sean talked yesterday about how spin orbit coupling works. Young Chen during the colloquium yesterday also talked about it. Um, and if you went to lab tours last night, you saw that we have two labs. So Sean talked about the research going on in one lab. I'm gonna talk about some of the research going on in the other lab. Um, so we have a slightly different system. We have a very elongated BEC with an aspect ratio of about 100 to one. Uh, and we have two counter propagating Raman beams. And this allows it so that we have spin orbit coupling that's constant along the entire BEC. And then what we do is we have this repulsive potential, a 660 nanometer diode um, that is focused down at the atoms and that is controlled using a galvanometer, which is a little rotating mirror. And this allows us to sweep the barrier across the BEC. Okay, and so we, we dress our system with this spin orbit coupling uh, dispersion and then we do our experiment. We then hit it with a hammer, like I like to say. Okay, and we can, I, we can sweep this barrier in either direction. So what we see is we have our initial BEC right here, and this is separated uh, using stern gerlach imaging after about 10 milliseconds of expansion. And so we start with the atoms all in the upstate, and then as we sweep, maybe it will as we sweep, so this is an example of a two millimeter per second sweep. So it's, I mean, it's pretty slow, but it makes it so that we can actually watch these dynamics happen, which is something that we love cold atoms for. So as we sweep, you see that there's a population of atoms that actually get spin flipped into the other direction. And so at the end of our sweep, we take 
we, we, we do this at a lot of velocities. So the largest velocity that we do this at is 41.6 millimeters per second. And the reason that's not an integer value is because we have to calculate these speeds based on the amount of time that it takes to sweep. And so that's why that's, that's the case there. But this is about 20 times the speed of sound in the, in the BEC. Um, so you see that at low velocities, you get a spin flip. And then as you go to higher and higher velocities, the atoms then start to tunnel through the, through the barrier and you're, you don't get any spin flip. Okay, so then we analyze our results. For some reason, that animation didn't work. We analyze our results. And so what we do is at the end of the, at the, end of the sweep, we calculate the spin polarization, which is the number of atoms in the up state. So the original state minus the number of atoms in the down state. You. So if you have minus one, that means that all of your atoms have flipped. Um, and then we also measure the transmission through the barrier. So you calculate, or you, cal you pretty much add up all the, all the atoms in the, that are left over in the system behind the barrier over the total number of the atoms in the system. And so then we plot this. And so red, red data points are sweeps to the right and blue data points are sweeps to the left. And so the, the big, big points are theory, little points are experiment. So if we sweep to the left, you see that they're pretty much constant over here. And the reason that theory doesn't necessarily match up with experiment is because we have some finite heating in the system. Okay, and so that, that kind of muddies the water. So you see that here in this picture, there's a little bit of uh, background that's there and that's from heating. Because I mean, we're, we're pushing the system, we're giving it energy, okay? And then if we sweep to the right, we see that we get this nice spin flip. Okay, so this is this, is this unidirectionality that I'm talking about, where you can only flip the spin in one direction. And you have areas of heating right here, which is kind of what's happening in this 10 millimeter per second area, where there's a little bit of atoms left over in the pushed area, and there's a little bit up here. Like I said, there's heating that's going on. Okay, so how can we understand what's actually going on in this system? So when we have a Gaussian barrier that's moving, we're imparting an, a certain amount of energy and momentum to our BEC, okay? And this is dependent on the velocity of the barrier as well as the parameters of the barrier, okay? So the Gaussian barrier is gonna have some height, it's gonna have some width, and it's gonna have a velocity. And so to understand this well, we do the Fourier transform of the time-dependent potential. And so instead of looking at it in position and time land, we're looking at it in frequency and wave vector land. And so when we do this, if you take the Fourier transform of Gaussian, you get a delta function. Um, and this delta function tells us that we can find energy solutions that lie along a two VB. So VB is the barrier velocity. So if I draw a linear line that represents two times the barrier velocity, then I'm going to get two solutions in the non-coupled system. I'm going to get one over here and one over there. So I have two solutions that work. Okay, but now I'm going to introduce spin-orbit coupling to the system. Okay, so keep in mind that the spin-orbit coupling, when you get a spin flip, you also get a two, two photon recoils of momentum. And so that's why this is shifted over by two kr. Okay, and from this, from this region where I'm doing my Raman transition, I can draw again those two, uh, those two, two VB slope lines. Okay, and I'm also going to get two solutions. Okay, you like that animation? It took me a lot of time to do. Um, <laughs> so we have two solutions. So there's one here, which corresponds to a transmission solution. So a solution where you have negative momentum but the, but the atoms are trans, transmitted through the barrier. And this star right here, which is the atoms that are reflected from the barrier. It turns out that because of the parameters of our barrier, we actually can't see the little purple triangles. Okay, that, that channel is quote unquote closed. But we can see these ones and that's what we're seeing in the experiment. And then if we sweep the other way, we see that there's no possibility to have any sort of spin flip transmission to that to that other spin state. Okay, so that's, that's the whole mechanism behind this unidirectionality, this, this uh, one-way spin switch. So uh, our theorists, so this is by Junpeng Hao, 
Ji Wang Lu and Chun uh, Wai Zhang at uh, University of Texas Dallas, um, and they did the they did these simulations with interactions. So these are the experimental parameters, and then they also did it without interactions. And they saw that if you were able to tune the interactions to a very, very low value, you're actually able to get at a perfect spin switch. This is just an example of a way that cold atoms and atomtronic devices can be used to inspire new and novel types of spintronic devices. And so we like doing cold atoms because they're fun, but there are actual practical applications too. So thank you. Here's our, these are all the people that were on that paper. And then we didn't have a group picture, so this is the best we can do right now. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, in the very second slide, I think you saw uh, some curve on the lower right hand side corner, which looked kind of like a hysteresis. So do you, when you sweep right and sweep left, do you have any residual spin up, spin down? It reminded me of a hysteresis loop from my high school textbook. Like that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Uh, no, uh, the one after this oh. maybe? Are you talking about this one? This is my this is my second slide. So forward, forward. There, there. That one. Okay, okay. So these are these are the transmission. So this is the transmission through the barrier. And what's going on here is that you have so your your Gaussian barrier is made up of many different frequencies. You can define your Gaussian barrier with lots of uh, lots of sinusoidal functions that then create your your actual Gaussian form um, and so when your when your atoms are you can essentially think about your barrier staying still and your atoms going towards it so it's a classical tunneling problem so if if you were to look at the um, the theoretical values for what you would get here you would see a step function essentially it would have a very narrow width but because we're in this real system that has heating associated with it, we have a wider type of uh, wider type of thing happening. So this is fit with a sigmoidal um, a sigmoidal fit, and the uh, the shading region, which you can actually barely see on this on this slide, has to do with 30 and 70 um, percent of the sigmoidal fit to either side of the center. So that's just the width that's defined of the sigmoidal fit. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I had two questions. One, I was wondering, is there um, any solid state uh, uh, um, setup that uh, this somewhat mimics, or is this uh, a situation where atomic physics leads solid state? So I think that it's probably the latter. Um, one of the things that we love about condensed matter, or about spin orbit coupling, is that the dispersion relations look a lot like the band structures that we typically see in condensed matter systems. Um, and so this is just a way to show that we can, the, the amount of control that we have in these experiments is super high, especially for spin orbit coupling experiments, you can tune many different parameters for those. So um, I think that it's definitely one of those things that someone could see this and say, hey, well, I know this material that has these properties. I wonder if we could do something like this as well. So I think that it's definitely the latter, um, but yeah. <laughs> Can I ask one yes. more question? I was just curious <laughs> in terms of, uh, can you fine tune uh, some of the, maybe the barrier parameters or other things such that uh, uh, the transmitted pulse uh, is- the, uh, the purple, the little purple yeah, guy? Yeah, has, has less excitations or things, it just, you know. Oh, oh, that guy, yeah. Um, so the, I mean, the barrier is uh, defined based on the optics that we use to create it, to focus it down. Um, if we were to, have a larger, uh, a larger incoming beam. The lens that's underneath the BEC, so this is coming up through the BEC. So here's the, the elongated BEC and we have the beam coming up and we sweep it across this way. Okay, so, um, so the lens that's underneath there is a very fixed type of thing. It took a long time to get that aligned and to get it, uh, <laughs> to get it the right distance, a way to make sure that it was focusing at the atoms. Um, 
so that one's a little fixed. And the other unfortunate thing is that we can't necessarily make a bigger beam because the size of the mirror for the galvanometer is also a fixed size. So you're going to have, if you try to make it any bigger, you're going to have diffraction effects that are causing issues with your, with your actual beam. So in principle, we could make the beam waste larger, but I don't know if we'd be able to make the beam waste smaller than what we have here, which would be really cool because then we would see that little purple triangle, the transmission. And I think that would be a really interesting thing because it has negative momentum, which is something that is um, kind of an exciting type of thing to think you have a spin switch that moves the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, a quick comment. When I was at the, uh, the uh, previous NQN meeting in Seattle in November, there was a, a gentleman there who was doing quantum dot stuff, and they were able to induce spin flips by applying static voltages to the electrons using the spin orbit coupling intrinsic in the material. So this is kind of a very tunable example of that. And in, that, in, in the solid state case, you need really strong spin orbit coupling in order to get this, this electric potential to magnetic coupling. But it is possible. I think they're still working on that, though. Would you please explain one more time why the spin flip, ha spin flip happens? Why the spin flip happens? You want me to go over my mechanism slide again? <laughs> Can you show it in terms of the dispersion this time? Use the, use oh, the spin orbit sure. dispersion. Sure. Okay. So we're starting in this state right here. And the spin orbit coupling has a directionality associated with it. So when we sweep to the right, that's in positive x direction, but it also is positive quasi-momentum direction. Okay, so when we, when we sweep to the right, we end up giving it a momentum kick in that direction. And you could probably imagine that you would be able to cross over the negative mass region and move into the actual other spin state. Whereas if you kick it in the other direction, there's no, there's no other spin state in that direction. Okay, so if you look at the dispersion, you can also imagine this. I like using the other, um, the other picture. So the other picture is not, so this is a rotated basis. This is where the math is easy for spin orbit coupling. Um, the way that I had it before, I just had the, the two parabolic uh, dispersions just on top of each other, just split in energy like they would be Zeeman split. So that would be before the, um, before the rotation into a new basis. But in that picture that I showed with them on top of each other, that's in the regular momentum space. That's not quasi-momentum. And so then I can talk about momentum kicks from a barrier because I don't have to convert it to quasi-momentum. So that's, that's why I like to use that picture. You have a burning question? <laughs> go, go ahead. Like there's a different velocity going right and going left. Like isn't there a time where it's kind of different? Oh, um, so that has to do with the with the amount of momentum that's given to the system, and then combined with that two k recoil momentum. So that transmission channel, it's a little funny. I I'm, I might talk to you afterwards about it because I don't I don't know if I have a really short explanation for that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I would really like to be able to see that because like I said, a spin flip with the opposite direction of momentum from the way that you're kicking it is a very interesting problem that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll talk to you about that after. Hello. Oh would it work if instead of a uh, repulsive barrier, you would use uh, attractive potential? Uh, so we have done some preliminary studies with that um, and we have done sweeping and yes, you do see that you do get a spin flip. Uh, it's a lot weaker though because, and it really depends on the, the depth of your potential. So if you have an attractive, an attractive beam, um, you're going to suck all your atoms in there and when your atoms fall into a deep potential, they're going to become very excited and very heated and so you actually get more heating in the system experimentally that is. Um, I don't know if you would necessarily see that in numerics, uh, but we have, we have done that, but we, we never, you know, did anything with it. It's just kind of sitting around right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have, uh, we'll, let's thank Marit again, please. Thank you. Okay. And uh, of course, we've saved the best for last. Peter Engels is uh, going to tell us a little bit about the Cold Atom Lab, I believe, which is the uh, Bose-Einstein experiment on the International Space Station. He has lots of pretty pictures for us. It's in space, space, space.
All right, so thank you. I know I'm the last speaker at this conference, at least as far as the regular talks are concerned. We have another little uh, discussion session afterwards. And I also am aware of the fact that we are somewhat over scheduled, uh, you know, as far as the time is concerned. So I will try to keep it uh, short and uh, entertaining. So at this conference, you have already heard about some of the stuff that's going on in terms of quantum gases here at WSU. Like Sean has uh, spoken on the uh, quantum simulation of spin orbit matter. Um, Maren just told you a little bit about the unidirectional spin switch and atomtronics. We also have got a, a strong program in quantum hydrodynamics, such as uh, turbulence and shocks and all kinds of multi-component solitons. But for the sake of this last talk from the conference, I will just um, tell you a, bit, a little bit about CAL, NASA's Cold Atom Lab which is a facility that uh, we are using for few body physics, but instead of going into the few body physics over here, which is maybe a little bit uh, too much, um, you know, at this late hour and all, I will focus more on the technological aspects because this is a very interesting uh, example for how quantum technologies have actually matured and how, how robust they can be built. Okay, so I will be talking about ultra cold atoms in space. This is a collaboration between uh, my group, in particular, Maren Mossman is involved in it, and myself, uh, people from Jilla, the University of Colorado, Jose Dinkau, Eric Connell, and Jason Ho at Ohio State University, together with a very talented team of scientists and engineers at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. So you know that we can do uh, wonderful things with ultra-cold atoms, uh, be it neutral atoms or ions, in all our labs. And usually what we need for this is something like this. We need uh, one laser, one table full of uh, fibers and optics and a vacuum machine in the middle, and maybe another table uh, full of optics. So all this works really nicely and there are wonderful things that have been done with these quantum gases. However, um, there's one little issue or one little problem that sometimes uh, what is bothering us. And this is that the Bose-Einstein condensate, unfortunately, will fall under gravity. And so this, was, this means that in order to confine it, uh, that we must confine it in a trap to support it against gravity. Sometimes this is not an issue, but sometimes we want to study quantum matter in the purest form without the influence of the trap. So the question is, how do you do this if you want more than just a couple milliseconds of free fall? The idea is to go into permanent free fall. Oh, that's fine. I can also stand here when, if it's bothering you. So this thing comes to mind, which is the International Space Station over here. So the International Space Station essentially is continuously falling around the Earth. So if you're on board the International Space Station, you're falling along with it and you don't feel gravity anymore. It's kind of like in the elevator when the rope gets cut. Now, one may think it's a little bit tricky to uh, condense uh, two laser, or to take two laser tables and actually install them on the International Space Station. There's not too much space in there. So it's actually quite an engineering feat to condense a whole BEC machine into uh, something that you can uh, take up there. And this is something that uh, the engineers at JPL have, have done. This is actually not only a rubidium machine, it's a dual species rubidium potassium machine. And it's, it's called CAL for the Cold Atom Lab. It's a NASA facility. Um, this is what it looks like in real size. This is Dave Everline working on it. This is the, uh, the machine itself. It has got a 2D mod, which gets uh, then uh, which sends an atomic beam into a 3D mod. It's a 2D mod, 3D mod apparatus. And then it's an atom chip machine. So there's an atom chip over here that does the trapping and the evaporative cooling. This is the science module over here. You know what I showed, uh, showed you here again. It's all wrapped up in new metal. This is sitting on this part of the uh, apparatus. Here we have got lasers, control electronics, and uh, then there's another little box with some laser amplifiers. So the solar apparatus is actually fairly compact. This is an optics table over here. You can see the one inch spacing. So it's about the size of a dishwasher. So this instrument in its first form was uh, completed in 2018 and was sent up to the International Space Station in a sickness capsule. Here you can see uh, the people um, from orbital actually pushing it into the sickness capsule they had stowed away. And then it typically takes about three days after launch during which the capsule actually catches up with the International Space Station. And you know, sometimes when you're lucky or if you, if you look for it, 
uh, you can see if uh, pass by by the International Space Station outside. You can look up on a web page when it's going to happen in your area. And if it's the right height of the space station and uh, if it's dark enough, you can see, see it. it looks like a star that moves from one side of the, uh, of the sky to the other. But you can tell it's the space station because it's much, fa much faster than a, than a star. So it just takes uh, maybe a, a, you know, a minute or whatever, I don't know, to move from one point to the other. But here actually, Sean was very lucky because he did not only catch the ISS, but also the sickness capsule with our instrument. You know, this is the sickness capsule during this three-day flight as it was actually catching up with the ISS over here. All right, so this instrument is uh, installed in the Destiny module, which is the uh, American module at, uh, on board the International Space Station. And you can kind of see it over here. It's completely remote controlled from the ground. And this is quite amazing. There's no interference with the astronauts. You know, they are not working with the, with the instrument. Nobody is aligning any mirrors anymore. It really tells you how robust quantum technologies have become that you can construct a BEC machine on the ground, wrap it up, send it up there. All the astronauts had to do actually put it into this express rack over here and put some fibers in, some optical fibers connecting some modules, but there was no alignment done or whatever. The whole instrument is uh, remote controlled from ground, uh, from, a, from an operation center at the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Here you can see Maren pushing some buttons at the, uh, at the computer. So this is actually a remote desktop from JPL to the computer on the International Space Station. So it's quite amazing that, uh, you know, um, one can push a button over here and something, uh, you know, uh, like 250 miles above the ground, something moving at the speed of uh, 17,000 miles per hour is creating a BEC because someone down here pushed the button. It's, a, it's essentially real time. So it's such that you, you push and you see what you are doing. It's not that you push and you have to wait a couple of minutes or something. Mm -hmm. So this is a user facility, and there are in total right now five uh, groups in the U.S. Uh, are working with this instrument. One is our collaboration that I mentioned over here, and we are doing few body physics. I will just show you two slides on it. Um, Cass Sackett is doing extreme adiabatic cooling. You can imagine that if you don't need to support the uh, BEC against gravity anymore, one trick that you can do is just take the trap and make it weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker until it gets really, really weak. And as you do so, the temperature goes down. Uh, on ground, there's a limit because at some point you're not supporting it against gravity anymore. So you need a finite trap, but you don't need this in microgravity. Nathan Nantlott is doing interesting experiments uh, where he is generating bubble geometry of the uh, yeah, bubble geometry, Bose-Einstein condensates using our f dressed potentials. Jason Williams and Jose Ding Kao have got a, uh, a study on the controlled interactions for mitigating systematics and space-based atom interferometries. The idea of space-based atom interferometries is again that you may have very long observation times because the cloud doesn't drop out of your, out of your view, uh, field of view. And Nick Bigelow is um, leading a consortium on ultra cold atoms in space, they have mostly focused on shortcuts to adiaparticity. So what we want to do, our team, is to study few body physics. If you take three identical bosons and you change the scattering length, so you start with the weak scattering length and you increase it more and more and you go towards, uh, towards unitarity, then few body theories uh, tells you that they're very interesting uh, states, so-called Efimov states, that are very large and super fragile, probably a lot, uh, the most fragile things you can think of. See, if you've got typically a molecule like H2O or something, then the spacing between the atoms is maybe on the angstrom size. Here, we are talking about the molecule where the spacing between three atoms is on the order of, uh, of nanometers. So it's about, you know, not, not just few many nanometers, but, uh, but maybe, you know, 50 nanometers or more. And then few body physics also tells you that there's a whole series of these, uh, of these guys, where each one is a factor 22.7 larger than the previous one. So there's a geometric scaling over here. So the second state, and this is the one that we actually want to see on the ISS, 
already has got about the size of a bacteria, but is consisting only of three atoms. So you can imagine that these three atoms don't see each other very often, so they are actually very loosely bound. And this is why we need uh, very, very cold temperatures. Here's a more scientific view of the same, uh, same issue. Say so you've got three free atoms over here, and this axis is one over the scattering length. So out here and out here, my scattering length is low, and in the middle, I'm at unitarity. And so if three atoms over here at the positive scattering length come together and collide, two of them can form a molecule, which is a dimer, and the third particle can take the binding energy out. So this here is energy, and this tells you how strongly bound the dimer is. On this side over here, where the scattering length is negative, no such dimer exists. However, by the magic of few body physics, three particles can bind, even though two particles are not bound. Okay, and not only is there just one of these states, but there's an infinite series of these states, and I've only drawn two of these. So in the experiments, you start over here, you tune the scattering length, and as you go over here, you hit the resonance, so the atoms like to stick to together longer. Therefore, there are more three-body losses, and you see a dip in your atom number. And what we are interested in is actually seeing this guy over here and seeing the geometric scaling. So where one guy is just affected 22.7 uh, larger than the previous guy. And this is going to teach us a lot about few-body physics. Why is microgravity uh, very favorable for this? I already mentioned, imagine you've got the atoms in a trap over here, and then imagine you suddenly turn the trap off. If you're in microgravity, the atoms don't fall, but the cloud still expands. See this here. Then after uh, a certain expansion time, you can very briefly turn on, at a large strength, the harmonic trap again. So very briefly, the harmonic trap will kick on again, and this is instantaneously, essentially, not instantaneously, but very rapidly stopping all the atoms at the same time. So now you have a cloud that is very, very large and very, very cold. And down here, this, uh, if you watched it, this was just the same evolution in phase space. And those are the conditions that we actually need. We need ultra-cold temperatures, and we need very dilute clouds. Ultra-cold temperatures, because these guys that we are, these three-body, um, bound states are very fragile. Very low densities we want because we don't want any perturbing atoms in between the two atoms that are bound together. So we want it in the purest form. This is essentially uh, the scientific part of my talk. Um, it turns out that unfortunately I had missed the first uh, rocket launch. I was not able to go there. But just in December, so uh, December a couple of weeks ago, an upgraded version of the science module was sent up to the ISS. This one is a little bit different because it has got atom interferometry capabilities built into it. Unfortunately, I was able to go to the rocket launch there. So at the very end of this conference, I'll just show you some, uh, some nice pictures from a rocket launch to round it out, right? So uh, this is uh, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral. This is launch pad number 40, which is famous also for the Cassini-Huygens mission, which went up to Saturn. Um, what we see here is uh, the team from JPL, or team members from the JPL. This is me. In the background, you see a uh, Falcon 9 rocket. That's from SpaceX, SpaceX Falcon 9. These rods over here, they are just for lightning control. This was in the very early morning. Now, the SpaceX rockets, they are special in the sense they use a load and go procedure, which means they are fueled up just until three minutes before launch, which means when you're ver they are very early, maybe they allow you to actually go to the launch pad and see the rocket. If this had been full of rocket fuel, there would be no way that we would have been allowed to go there. So then, uh, you know, the rocket gets prepared, and at the end, there's about 65,000 gallons of liquid oxygen and about 39,000 gallons, uh, gallons of RP-1 rocket fuel in this thing. And the lift off weight is about 1,200,000 pounds. And so here we are. This is uh, about five hours later. You can see there's a nice countdown over here. It's getting more and more interesting. Okay, there goes the rocket and up it flies. 
if you watch a rocket launch from a couple miles distance, it's quite amazing because this thing lifts up and you hear nothing, total silence. And then after a couple of seconds, the sound revives first as a low rumbling and then it gets louder and louder with a nice crackling sound. So the rocket is a two-stage rocket. You can see the first and the second stage over here, where the first stage is designed to push you through the atmosphere. Then up there, the aerodynamics change, and the second, rock, the second stage takes over and, and pushes you out under your orbit. The uh, first stage, after about seven or eight minutes into the flight, returns to Earth and lands on a drone ship that's out in the Atlantic Ocean. So this is from an earlier mission. This is from CRS-8, we were CRS-19, but it worked the same way. So here you can see uh, the first stage actually coming down, landing on the drone ship, while the second stage is still up in space and on its way. Right now it's at 18,000 kilometers per hour. Eventually, this is going to be 27,000 kilometers per hour to catch up with the International Space Station. So then the uh, capsule moves on. This is the Dragon capsule from, uh, from uh, SpaceX. And this is a picture from the International Space Station up in 250 miles, looking down onto Earth with the, uh, with the Dragon capsule cruising below it. So the space station and the Dragon in this picture, they are cruising along together at 17,000 miles per hour. Then in a couple of steps, the, uh, the capsule actually approaches further, uh, closer and closer to the International Space Station, always in steps, until it's finally captured by a robotic arm and put onto, the, uh, onto a dock. So this procedure is called dock, uh, birthing as opposed to docking. Here we see uh, Christina, uh, Christina Koch, Expedition 61 flight engineer on board the International Space Station as she's actually installing the uh, Science Module 3 in one of these express racks, express racks in the Destiny module. This was actually January 28, uh, 2020. So just a few uh, days ago, uh, two weeks ago actually. Yep. And then as of uh, February 14, uh, this instrument has again created its first BEC. So it's just been about two weeks after the unwrapping on board the ISS that uh, the JPL team was able to make it work again and get BECs. So it's actually a testimony for how stable this, this device is. Then um, the, Cygnus, uh, the, the Dragon capsule actually gets filled up with stuff that you don't want on the ISS anymore and it returns to Earth. So it's not uh, glowing, it's not burning up in the atmosphere but it's actually uh, coming down and then it's landing here in the ocean. This is actually from Demo 1 mission in March, but uh, our capsule was recaptured as well. This is uh, the Dragon 90 from our mission. Okay, lands over here and then is uh, retrieved. Mm -hmm. Now just for clarification, I should say our instrument was not the only one on the SpaceX, right? So there were in total 40 different uh, experiments that the, space, that the Falcon 9 rocket actually launched at that time. We were just one part of it. Okay, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, your, uh, for, your, uh, for being here. And I should also say special thanks because this is kind of like the uh, end of the program, except for the uh, discussion session that we have. I want to express special thanks to my colleagues from the organizing team, including Sean and Michael and Deep Gupta, Boris Binov and Brent van der Wender. I think it was a very nice uh, conference for all of us and thank you for having helped to uh, make it this event. I want to thank Robin Stratton from WSU Physics and Astronomy Administration who had to put out many fires also in the last minutes. Um, I thank the WSU Office of Research, in particular Vice President uh, Chris Keen and Assistant Vice President Peter Dutta. Um, the staff at WSU OWAP, in particular Emily Brashier, who helped us with the conference organization and made, made sure that the uh, food is on the table and all. Uh, I want to thank the Department of Physics and Astronomy and the WSU Office of Research for their financial support of, of this event. So they have uh, ponied up for the food and for the poster boards and for the, for, the, uh, for the boom over here and more. And most important, I want to thank all of you for having come here uh, to this workshop.